Welcome back to my review of every Pokemon anime series. In this video, we're going over the fifth anime series, Pokemon XY. Without question, this series is insanely popular thanks to its many innovations, but now that it's been a few years and the hype has died down, is it still the god tier series we remember it to be? Or is XY really just an overrated series? Well, after rewatching every single episode, it's finally time to find out. So joining me today are Shiny Zoroark, Tyrone the God 3, and the Pokerath. What's up everyone, Shiny Zoroark here, aka Zoro. Hello everybody, Tyrone the God 3 here. Hey, what's going on guys, my name's Raph, and you won't be kicking me out this time. Anyways, like the black and white review, we'll be going over a list of individual topics, going over the pros and cons of each, and then wrapping things up with the final verdict. So without further ado, grab some popcorn, grab some cookies, and let's get started with our retrospective review of the Pokemon XY anime. First thing we gotta talk about is the boy Ash Ketchum. How could we not? One of the best things about XY is Ash's return to form as a Pokemon trainer. He's no longer forgetting things like he did in the previous series, and now has a lot of experience once again. Because of this, Ash is an absolute badass again, during and outside of battles. What helps push this even further is the fact that Ash in XY is a huge influence to everyone around him more than ever before. Characters like Serena, Clement, Sawyer, and even Alon all have an admiration for Ash, and it's what helps them all become better trainers in the end. It's awesome! Ash has always been an influential trainer, but this is really the first series since AG where it feels like he's at the top of the food chain and it makes sense. Unlike Black and White where it felt like Ash was mostly succeeding thanks to his unpredictability, in XY, Ash is back to being way more strategic and using his Pokemon to the best of their abilities. Some might argue that he didn't really have much of an arc in this series, but we highly disagree. In this series, it seems like the main theme with Ash is that he was trying way too hard to win. Because he was so determined to reach his goal this time, it sometimes caused him to be blinded by his own ambition instead of calmly thinking things through. Although this will sometimes lead to his downfall, these moments did allow Ash to grow as a trainer and become even better. A perfect example of this is when he tries to copy Tiano's rhythmic battle style, but then realizes it wasn't going to work for him. There's also the battle against Ramos where Ash felt overwhelmed and almost lost, but was able to turn things around once he was able to calm down and come up with a new strategy. And how could I leave out the biggest example, when Ash got cocky and became too over-reliant on the Ash Greninja transformation. The minute he started to focus more on the power of the transformation instead of being in sync and working with Greninja, was the moment he began to fail and eventually doubt himself. But thanks to a certain person, Ash is able to snap back to reality, master the transformation, and finish his Kalos run as a way better trainer than the one he started off as. This kid's got a lot of style. Speaking of style, let's talk about battles. Holy these battles. For the first time, the battles in Pokemon have 3D, 3D camera, camera, and it looks amazing. The choreography shows how cool some Pokemon move mid-battle, as well as show the skills and strategy of the trainers. That's right, these battles aren't just a pretty face. In gym battles especially, Ash shows the combos he's learned in all of them, like maintaining balance on a thin ice battlefield, jumping on rock tombs, breaking trick room, and timing future sight. Each battle was a new challenge for Ash so that he could be strategic, and while some of the solutions were a bit odd, they did a perfect job showing how Ash thinks outside of the box, no pun intended. Pokemon has shown on multiple occasions that the best way to learn about a trainer is during battle, and this holds the most in this series. You can see the growth in battles, like when Clement came back to the Lumios gym and battled Klimbot with Bunnelby and beat his experienced Heliolus using out-of-the-box combos he learned from watching Ash. One of my favorite moments is when James's Inke blinded Pikachu and Ash was Pikachu's eyes for the battle. If you watched the OG series and saw how Pikachu was useless in that fight against coughing under the same conditions, it really shows us how Ash has grown as a trainer, or how Serena was disguised as Ash and was able to hold her own against Jimmy with his Pikachu. This was the series where actions definitely spoke louder than words, and for Ash and his team, they had a lot to say. Ah yes, the famous Kalos team. Most would argue that prior to the Sun and Moon series, Ash's Kalos team was the best team yet. There's a lot of things to consider with this team, and it's more than just strength, cool designs, and personality. 
but also development. From its debut as a Fletchling, Talonflame has always had a strong willpower and been keen to show off its power. It received a nice piece of development during the Sky Battle episode thanks to Bonnie's motivational words, saying that size doesn't matter. These words later on gifted us with Fletchling evolving and taking down its final stage evolution. Speaking of which, let's not forget where we saw Talonflame in full flaming force, having the power to go head to head with the legendary Bird Moltres. It was such an outstanding evolution segment for one of Ash's coolest and strongest birds. Next we have Halucha. I bloody love this guy. When we think of Halucha, we think of many words. Cool, strong, personality, and most of all, brother. Beyblade X Scissor? <laughs> yeah, we won't talk about that. But when Noibat hatched, things changed. Despite the whole macho persona and distinctive battle style, Halucha took on the role of being the older brother of Noibat. The pride this Pokemon showed in and out of battles was immense. What's not to love about this luchador? Gudra. The transition from it being a weak and terrified Gumi to a strong and confident Gudra was a great way to turn this Pokemon around. The writers literally turned the weakest dragon into a beast. Growing confidence to fight and protect the wetlands really made me like Gudra. And please, let's not forget the relationship it had with Dedene. But then there's the Kalos Leak. Ah, shit. Yeah, this is gonna be awkward. Hmm. I still love you though. Ash's fifth team member was the Soundwave Pokemon Noivern. Back as a Noibat, this Pokemon screamed cute all over it. Oh, just look at the little guy, so cute. Learning how to fly was one of the biggest tasks for this baby bat, but after mastering this act, it played a vital role on Ash's team in searches, and heck, it had a nice episode with it learning acrobatics. Taking on Zapdos 2 and saving its big hermano Halucha upon evolving was a blessing in itself. But that's it. Yeah, it got a draw against Salamence in the semi-finals of the Kalos League, but that's not enough to justify its lack of screen time. Poor guy got done dirty, man. We just wish it had more time to shine. And finally, we saved the best till last, Kikoga. Oh, poor Sachi Kikoga, come back to me. Hold up, bro. If anyone's gonna talk about Greninja, you know it's gotta be me. Ugh, you bastard. Now, I don't gotta tell you, but I'm gonna do it anyways. Greninja is f awesome. What's great about Greninja is that it was a Pokemon that was looking for the right trainer to bring out its true power, and it found that with Ash. Even before the whole Bond Phenomenon stuff came into play, it's just always been a very reliable Pokemon. I think it's due to the fact that it's the Pokemon that is the most like Ash. Greninja hates to lose, and loves to train and battle more than anything else. So these two were a perfect match. It was so cool seeing it go through its different evolutionary stages. And it even got some great development episodes whenever the gang ran into Sanpei and his Greninja. This all culminated into their final meeting, where it not only fully evolved, but also, for the first time, tapped into its new form, Satoshi Gekoga. Ash and Greninja would then have an awesome training arc dedicated to mastering the form, and it's what helped Ash take him all the way to the Kalos League Finals. And yeah, he might have failed us all in the end, but then right after that, it redeemed itself by saving the freaking world. A true chat hero if you ask me. Do I agree with how it was released, however? Well, that's something we're gonna have to touch on later. Oh, boss, that's Chikagoga. Shut up. But for now, how about we move on to our next big character of the series? You already know I had to be the one to cover. <clears throat> Serena! Now, this character has become one of the most controversial people in the entire Pokemon anime, and that's mainly because of her fans. But we're here to talk about the character, not the fans, and honestly, there's a lot of good things about Serena. For one, she has a relatively unique motive, and that's because of her crush on Ash. That's why she started her journey in the first place, and as much flack as Amore shipping gets, when I rewatched some of these moments, I realized it's not as in your face as I remembered. They actually used the romance for some great developmental moments throughout the series, and I found myself enjoying them a lot more when I was able to analyze the scenes instead of just being like, ooh, Amore shipping confirmed, ah! Now, Serena isn't perfect. While I think her struggling to find a goal in the beginning was a good direction to take her, I can't lie, it did take a little too long for them to establish her goal. I mean, nearly the whole first season she was just there and didn't do much at all. Another complaint is the personality shift from before and after she cut her hair. While I understand that the haircut was a big moment that really kicked off Serena's new era, I did feel as if the sassy parts of her personality were somewhat lost after. I get she was maturing, but the change was somewhat abrupt, that's all I'm saying. Speaking of the haircut though, that really was a pivotal moment in her development. I think you saw a lot of confidence in her after. A lot of people know this, but in Japan, a major hairstyle change like that actually symbolizes the end and beginning of an era in a person's life, and I think they executed that nicely with Serena. Briefly talking about her Pokemon though, we have her starter, Brakeson, Pancham, and also Sylveon. 
Now, nothing against these Pokemon, but I kind of wish he had more than three. I know they wanted it to be a smaller crowd for performances, but it would have been kind of cool to see her have a wider group of Pokemon to choose from like some of the other female companions. Also, I think they wrapped up her character nicely in the end, and this again ties with Amor shipping, but I think it's somewhat poetic that her entire journey centered around Ash because he's why she started, but by the end she gained the courage and confidence to forge her own path in life separate from it. Then we have Pokemon Showcases, a huge part of her character, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Zack for this topic. Pokemon Showcases were anime exclusive competitions that are pretty much like the beauty pageants of the Pokemon world. What's cool about them is that unlike contests from Hoenn and Sinnoh, Showcases were a lot more hands on and not only showed off the Pokemon, but the trainer as well. Because Showcases are such a spectacle, some of the best animations in all of XY are seen here, so it's just one big colorful Sakuga fest, it's amazing. On top of looking great, it's also really cool that a lot of the first round theme performances or activities Serena already has experience in prior to her entry to showcases. It really relates back to what Ash said at the summer camp about how everything they do will help them reach their goals. As cool as this was though, I will say that it's also a little too convenient. Pokemon styling, Pokepuff baking, and even Rhyhorn herding? Nah, this shit's rigged man, that's just a minor nitpick though. If you want to get into some serious issues with showcases, then we gotta talk about how rushed they felt. First of all, you only need 3 princess keys to make it to the master class. That already makes Serena's goal extremely short because of how little she had to work to win. There's also the fact that it takes Serena a good 60 episodes to start competing in them. So we only get to see showcases for like half the series, actually it's less than that because the master class ends right before we even begin the Ash Greninja training arc. In my opinion, if showcases were introduced earlier on, it would have been way better. Pokemon contests were done well because they were always intended to play a big role in the AG and DP anime. Showcases however feel like an afterthought, like it's something they came up with along the way. This is actually made pretty obvious thanks to Arya. In the first Pokevision episode early in the series, Arya is said to be a famous pop star or whatever. But then, when showcases are finally revealed during the summer camp arc, it's now revealed that Arya is known for becoming Kalos Queen. How convenient. You see what I mean? Why couldn't they just mention this in her first appearance? In the end, showcases are fine, they just don't feel and aren't treated nearly as important as contests were. And I hate to keep comparing the two, but let's be honest, they were kinda just Contest 2.0. Alright, now let's talk about Clement. So, full disclosure, I love the XY gang, but if I had to choose a least favorite, it'd be Clement. Poor guy. He unfortunately was stuck in the Brock position where he cooks for the group and gives exposition to Serena during battles and has the running joke along with Bonnie. But if you look at his accomplishments before meeting Ash, Clement has his own level of respect. He invented the electric shower stations that are placed throughout Kalos, he worked on the programming in the Kalos power plant, and was even the top student at the Kuramine Academy. The major thing he lacked was courage and determination that he saw in Ash. This caused him to get kicked out of his own gym by Klembot, almost ruined the Lumios gym's reputation. But since having a brother like Bond with Ash, he's gained the courage and skill needed to not only take his gym back from his invention, but regain the trust of Luxray and become a tough gym battle for Ash. Gym leaders that travel with Ash in some situations, Brock and Misty, usually get kicked to the curb for in favor of Ash's growth. But here we get to see Clement grow from the boy he was to the gym leader that grew to be. And it's great. He even takes some steps to make the newly caught Pokemon Bunnelby fit with his team by teaching it Wild Charge in preparation for the battle with Ash. And Chespin, well, he was really just stale comic relief. But Clement showed that he made his mark as one of Ash's toughest battles yet. Now sadly after their battle, the series does focus more on Serena, Ash, and Bonnie's characters so Clement does get pushed back a little bit. But as Grove still shows in small doses, he's more assertive and confident in his inventions and some of them do come through, like when he helped Ash and Greninja measure the wavelengths of the bomb phenomenon for, say the thing Zack, Satoshi Gekoga. He later confronted Team Flare by defending Prison Tower and was able to best Zorosic in a battle of science. He may be the weakest link in the XY group in terms of overall character, but he has plenty of it. The future is now thanks to him and science. Last, but certainly not least out of the bunch, we have Clement's little sister Bonnie. Bonnie brought a breath of fresh air to the group. She was funny, motivating, and most of all, caring to all of the people and Pokemon she interacted with. Her gentle and adorable personality really made us all go, oh, might want to add the sound effect in that bro. <laughs> Bonnie's earlier episodes showed off how much she loved to pet Pokemon and would hope to aspire to become a Pokemon trainer herself in the future. Even though she is a child, the maturity level she had for her age was quite on form and this was thanks to the nurturing of her older brother, even if she wanted to find him a wife and criticise his inventions at times. Now I know what you're thinking, 
But Raph, what about Max? He was a good companion too as well, right? Eh, I mean, he was okay. But in terms of Bonnie, there's a huge difference in what makes her stand out compared to him. There have been numerous episodes where Bonnie would motivate, care, and show off the personality of a Pokemon trainer. Examples of this would be motivating Fletchling in the Skybell episode. And if we move on to the Flebebe and Tyrant episode, we can see how Bonnie looked after both of these Pokemon, protecting them from Team Rocket, and reuniting them with their original trainers. We've even seen segments of Bonnie confidently commanding Dedene and other Pokemon in battle situations, which for a little girl her size, is pretty impressive. Now that's not to say Max didn't have all of these qualities either, but the key difference between Bonnie was her role in the series and how it had a prominent part overall, and that's thanks to Squishy. Compared to Z2, Squishy was living the life of Riley with Bonnie. It was thanks to Bonnie's soft and gentle character that Squishy learned to trust humans. While she is a little girl, the qualities she brought to the group and Pokemon around her will not only benefit them, but also herself. Even though there were times her childish behaviour got the better of her, she always knew when to snap out and betray maturity, and that's something that makes her special. She would make a great trainer one day. Next let's talk about Team Rocket. They're a bit of a mixed bag in this series. When we get down to it, they're basically the same Team Rocket we had up until the end of the Diamond and Pearl series, but they don't appear every episode this time. Don't let me trick you though, because they still appear pretty often, and a lot of the time it's just as annoying as it used to be. When XY starts, they're badass. They pretty much wipe Ash and Clement by using Wobbuffet, who just rejoined the trio. But after that, they kinda start the whole Garchomp ordeal, which, while those two episodes were amazing, it is a bit annoying Team Rocket went back to their usual shenanigans. Also, I know Black and White Team Rocket is a bit of a controversial topic, but after how different they were in that series, it was kinda lame that they regressed a little bit. That being said, there is still a lot of fun stuff with this group. Like I said, Wobbuffet came back and it was awesome because he's always felt like an iconic part of the group. I really like Jesse and James' relationships with their Pokemon also. For one, we have Inkei that James caught early in the series. This is one of the all-time best trainer to Pokemon relationships in the series, honestly. The best example is James managing to break through the hypnosis that Malamar cast onto his Inke through their mutual bond, and later on in the same episode, that bond paid off as Inke opted to stay with James instead of going off with a group of Inke and Malamar. That was so wholesome. On the other hand, we have Jesse's Gorgeist. This Pokemon is pretty great as well. I really like the parallels between it and Jesse's personality, and this Pokemon also participates in Pokemon performances. Jesse competing in these is another good part of Team Rocket in the series, not only because it gives her a purpose for existing other than being in Team Rocket, but also because she actually participates in them without cheating. For the most part. Unlike in past series with Pokemon contests, Jesse gets to the Masterclass with completely legitimately earned Princess Keys. Unfortunately, two out of those three keys were earned off screen, which sucks! But this shows that Jesse has taken the knowledge she learned from the past series and gotten better here because of it. Overall, Team Rocket is still a lot less annoying in this series than in the past, and while they did feel a bit samey, there was a lot of good from them this time around. Now, let's talk about Summer Camp Rivals. After the Mega Evolution training arc with Karina, the series took a well-needed break with the Summer Camp arc, and with that, the introduction of the Summer Camp trio. Trevor, Shauna, and Tyrino. Unlike the other two, Trevor was done the worst compared to his game counterpart, sadly. He gets the least amount of episodes in his performance in the Kalos League was terrible with him getting swept in the first round. I will give him some credit though, he did appear in the Moltres episode which is one of my favorite episodes in the series, and did master Mega Evolution which, if we've seen from Karina, was a feat of, of itself. It's a shame we didn't get to see at least a show of flashbacks for Trevor's struggles during his Alon battle. I don't know, would have been a lot better than watching Ash battle the butthurt broski here, just saying. Then there's Tyrino, who put Ash to a bit of a mental conflict. Tyrino actually beat Ash in a brief introduction to camp battle, showing off his dance battle style. which was so impressive Ash thought he could copy it, but we already know that was a fail. Tyrano serves as a nice mid-rival for Ash. While not as strong as Alon and not being in the learning stages like Sawyer, he served to give Ash the competition he needed in order to stay sharp. Having three other battles with him later in the series and being a somewhat romantic rival of Ash's, if you want to put a more into it, eh? Speaking of that, there's Shauna, and I find this dynamic with Serena very interesting, considering that when they first meet, Shauna is the one who idolizes Serena because of her promo videos earlier in the series. Like, oh my god, girl, I saw you on the internet. Serena then gets introduced to what the Poke Showcase is, so because of this, Serena actually takes interest in You can basically say that Shauna's the Kickstarter for her finding a goal. So for that, I respect her. Now, not to cut you guys short here, but while we're on the topic of showcase rivals, I feel there's a better person to fit into this topic, so I'll let Zoro take over from here. 
So other than Shauna, Serena still has a few main rivals. First off, we have Miette. Miet is actually a pretty cool character. A lot of the time there's some fun teasing between her and Serena because they both have a crush on Ash. I really like the baking contest when she gets introduced because yeah, there's her and Serena's rivalry, but the end of the episode on good terms. Like Tyrone said with Tierno and Ash, Miet served well as a driving force for Serena's improvement, both in performances and the other competition. Unfortunately, we never actually see her win anything on screen, but I think she was a welcome addition. The person I don't think is a welcome addition, though, is Nini! <coughs> Alright, if you like Nini, all the power to you, I guess. I just found her kind of weird and forgettable. She was introduced in a cool way because it seemed like her and Serena were really building and improving off of each other in Nini's debut episode, but she rarely appears after that. I just think if you were going to introduce Miette and have her not really win anything, what was the point in introducing such a minor rival to also not win anything? The last one is Arya, and while she isn't technically a rival, at least in my book, she served a purpose well as the one to beat for Serena. I like how they established her as this celebrity so she had to go undercover in what would end up being a nice development episode for both her and Serena. Arena, as it brought Arya down to earth and made her at the very least a little more relatable. Now we move on to one of the bigger rivals of XY, Sawyer. He's basically Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire the character. Although introduced halfway through the series, he's still a fantastic rival for Ash. Honestly, his placement is perfect because he's pretty much an Ash fanboy. It's seeing the rookie Sawyer look up to our boy Ash and quickly work his way up to becoming an equal that makes this rivalry so satisfying. This plays an important part in the Ash Greninja training arc because it actually worries Ash when Sawyer manages to surpass him in gym badges. This rivalry wouldn't be as effective if he started his Kalos journey the same time as Ash. All of this, on top of having a Mega Sceptile that was a rival to Ash Greninja, is what really helped deliver an awesome battle in the Kalos League semifinals. It was pretty cool to get a friendly rival that didn't turn out to be a complete pushover in the end. Last but not least, we have Alan. He was a rather late addition to Ash's rivals in the XY series, but that didn't stop him from having an impact on Ash's character and the series overall. Alan was first introduced in the Mega Evolution specials, originally the assistant of Professor Sycamore, before being manipulated by Lysander to collect Mega Evolution energy for him. His aim was to be the strongest Pokemon trainer who possessed the capability of Mega Evolving Pokemon, no matter how grim and persistent he had to be, ignoring those that cared for him. He also had the best partner Pokemon in the flipping world, so that's a bonus in itself. Upon his introduction, he had a strong and cool character, which was also very close behind doors, but also highly knowledgeable. Alan first came across Ash battling Sawyer in which he noticed the incomplete Ash Greninja form. Since then, he grew a great interest for the form, and most of all, Ash. This built up their rivalry as we also saw Alan take on other trainers including gym leaders to reach his desire of taking on Ash at his absolute best in the Kalos League. Alan learned a key aspect of Pokemon battles with Ash and that was to have fun. With his disciplined mannerism and being brainwashed by Lysander, this caused him to forget about the teachings from Sycamore and even the people around him like Marin, but he later grew to remember about those that cared for him and that's what made his character really promising. He was living the life of yin and yang should we say. As for the Pokemon he had on his team, he had my boy, and of course, a really strong collection as well. Despite the whole manipulation from Team Flare, Alan has a strong head upon him, and after gaining inspiration from Ash, he decides to restart and embark on a new adventure with Marin to benefit himself. This was in search of a keystone and megastone that he could claim as his own. It's good to see that Sycamore's teachings played homage after all, especially with regards to Mega Evolution. Speaking of which, the specials are next on this list. Although they are mainly used as promotion for Pokemon capable of Mega Evolving, these four episode specials were also the build up to the Team Flare arc. We got to see Lysander's preparation in taking over Kalos by collecting Mega Evolution energy, and that was thanks to the help of Alan as well. Marin was also another character introduced alongside her partner Pokemon Chespi the Chespin. These specials created the foundation of what was to come in the XYZ series. It was also a great way to introduce us to Alan's character as we spoke about before, his backstory, and how he was unfortunately being used by Lysander believing that he was benefiting under the malicious director's orders. Overall thoughts? They were pretty cool. We saw Alan take on numerous trainers and Elite Four members, which just shows how powerful he is, the various mega evolutions in their clean designs, and even the likes of Groudon, Kyogre, and Rayquaza. We even got to see Squishy prior to its transition to XYZ, which of course played a big part in its arc. It's actually really fitting how each of these interactions across the specials added pieces to the puzzle, alongside the timeline in portraying the final outcome of the Team Flare arc that would unfold after the Kalos League. Speaking of which, it's Kalos League time, so let's sit back and watch Zack's review. What's up Lumios Trainers? Lumios Trainer Zack here. Welcome to the series where I review each Pokemon League arc in the anime. I'm just kidding. 
obviously. So the Kalos League is still a great league, don't let what I'm gonna say in a second make you think otherwise, but I have to be honest with you, this is probably one of the worst leagues from the perspective of the pacing. It seemed more like this was on the back burner for something else major. Most leagues are structured similarly with varying episode links. We get a setup episode where all the friends and rivals are reintroduced, and then the next episode we start the battles. This doesn't happen here. We get the reintroduction, opening ceremony, and the first round of battles all in one episode, including Alon vs Trevor, which Charizard X vs Charizard Y sounds like an epic matchup, except it only lasted 5 minutes. Are you kidding me? And they also introduced whoever the hell this is, and he didn't really do anything important. The next episode was just as rushed as they rushed through Ash vs Astrid which had the potential to be an iconic battle and then episode 3 were already at the semi-finals. What is this, the Kalos League? Oh wait. I understand they wanted to put focus on the big battles, but I personally believe they should have given more focus on some of the preliminary ones as well. Characters like Tierno and like I mentioned, Trevor and Astrid got shafted in favor of those major battles. Now onto one of the best things about the Kalos League, the final battles against Sawyer and Alon. Starting with Ash vs Sawyer, this is hands down the best battle of the league. After constantly getting tossed around like a ragdoll, Sawyer is finally an equal to his senpai Ash. What's great about this battle is that it does an excellent job at displaying Sawyer's growth. Things like using slacking to throw off Halucha's battle style or Clawitzer's midair aqua jet to slow down Talonflame shows that Sawyer has really gotten to know Ash's Pokemon and knows just how to deal with them. But what's also great about this battle is that it's all about Ash winning the way he knows best, with passion and unpredictability. When he lost to Sawyer, he wasn't in the right mindset, but here, he's back to his old self and is kicking ass. It's awesome! As for Ash vs Alon, this was just an epic battle. Pikachu taking out two pseudo-legendaries, an epic redemption for Halucha, and even an epic aerial battle? This was so damn cool. Not as deep as the battle between Ash and Sawyer, but this was just all about Ash and Alon having fun and giving it their all for this ultimate battle. The downside is that Ash doesn't win here, it's something that's still a sensitive topic to this day believe it or not, but it's totally understandable. The Kalos League, heck, the entire series was building up to Ash as the big winner in the end. Unfortunately, like Diamond and Pearl, the decision to make Ash lose feels very forced. Like Alon's Bisharp lands two one-hit KO moves? Are you kidding me? Well, at least Ash didn't lose to a random character since we did have the time to get to know Alon. And it's also a good thing that this wasn't the end though, cause in my opinion, I believe XY redeems itself with the true climax of the series. While the Kalos League ends in a rather sour note after Ash losing, I feel it does make up for it with Team Flare's arc. As far as evil team arcs go, there's no denying it and this is a hill I'm prepared to die on. The Team Flare arc is the best. It starts off right after the League, which is a nice change of pace here cause we get to see Ash and the others fight at their full strength. The arc starts with Lysander, the leader of Team Flare, announcing that people must be destroyed so that they can start the world anew. The arc has a main cast split into different areas to take care of the situation. Alon starts to realize that what he's been doing caused all this in the first place and has a mental breakdown. Clement fights in order to take back Prism Tower. Serena helps Marin find Chespi and Bonnie goes to save Poonichan. One thing I noticed while looking at this arc again is the amazing level of theming in parallel. Both Zygards go to battle, and when they do it shows how things ended up this way. Z2, the Zygarde under Team Flare's control, was attacked, captured, and experimented on, so his hatred towards humans is justifiable. Meanwhile, on the opposite end, we have Poonichan, or Z1, who is loved, cared for by Bonnie and the gang and witnessed kindness and the efforts of humans. So we see this opposing battle of ideas in which neither are wrong. They were both right, they were just exposed to the same thing in different ways, which makes it better when they break through Team Flare's control, which is also thematic. Z2 breaks through Team Flare's control by having Klimbot sacrifice himself, rest in peace, goodbye, to override the system. But before that, Bonnie breaks through Z1's control by singing the Poonie Chan song, reminding it of the times they spent together. <sighs> Shut up, you're crying. But both Zygarde's released from their control, they were just released in different ways based on theme. Clements was science and Bonnie's was love. The two happened right after each other. The writing here is so good, oh my god. I'm not even done though. After Ash helps Alon get his head straight and they defeat Lysander in battle, they go to save Chespi and that's when we get all, all of the, the Kalos, Kalos Gym Leaders. Seeing this plus Diantha and Steven Stone made me lose my mind. It's so cool to see everyone come together like this. Even Team Rocket puts in work saving Serena and Marin while updating people in the news about what's going on. Such a beautiful moment accompanied by the Vivo theme and seeing an all out war with Ash and the others fight off against the artificial Megalith Zygarde just puts everything I love about this series into one as they fight to prevent it from touching the sundial. 
all while Z1 convinces Z2 that this is the power of humans when they fight to protect something. This later allows Z2 to give in and join in the fight, infusing with Z1 in order to make 100% Zygarde. Let's just cut to the chase. This is straight up epic. In the games, we never got a proper story for Zygarde because Sun and Moon was announced too soon. And in the Sun and Moon games, we have a lame scavenger hunt to find all the cells. But here? Here's a proper story with build-up, and it delivers everything from Poonie Chan meeting the gang to the Mega Evolution specials. It was all leading to this, and the payoff is beautiful. See, this is how you do an evil team arc. There was never a moment wasted in my opinion, but after talking with the others, I guess I gotta name a con. <sighs> Fine. One thing I find odd about this is that Sawyer doesn't join the others along with the rivals in order to help fight against Artificial Zygarde. Now, the rivals and Sawyer do end up destroying some vines and saving some citizens, but it's only for a short time and the action cuts to the main cast mostly after that. While it is true I feel they would have been too cluttered in this battle, I'm not opposed to at least Sawyer being in the battle, considering that he's one of Ash's biggest rivals and ends up studying with Steven Stone after this. But other than that, it's a masterpiece. I honestly don't know what future series are going to do in order to top this one. To this day, these five episodes of Pokemon are my favorite in all of the series as a whole. It's clear XY had its limitations on story based on when the games come out, but seeing that shows that even in a tight time crunch, the writers can put their A game on and pace the series out to lead to an epic finish. Speaking of pacing... I just talked about the Kalos League's pacing, now let's talk about the entire series pacing. So in the first season and a half, I'd say that the pacing is relatively consistent. On average, I want to say we get about 15, 16 ish episodes between gyms, but after the fourth gym battle against Ramos, that pacing kind of goes out the window. Nine episodes after that, we get the amazing Lumios gym battle, and then only six episodes after we get the Valerie gym battle. Now, it's great that the battles happen so close to one another, but the problem is that because of it, there's a nearly 20 episode gap until the Olympia battle. Not to mention the way showcases are placed into the plot is a bit weird like Zack mentioned before. And another thing I noticed is Gudra's whole arc. I do love Gudra, and it's always going to be one of my favorite Ash Pokemon, but I do think that from its capture to its evolutions to its release, it was a bit quick for my taste. I mean, it evolved into Sligu in episode 61, and then 4 episodes later it evolved into Gudra. You know, so the pacing certainly isn't terrible, for the most part it's completely fine, but I did want to cover those few things that I noticed. Next up we have the filler, and in this series the filler is a weird situation, because when it's good it's really fun to watch. Some of the biggest examples of this are, for one, the Bonnie and Tyrantrum episode. A filler episode that can put me in tears like that, oh my god, so amazing. Wah wah, I'm Zora, wah, Bonnie and Tyrantrum, wah wah. Actually, that was quite a sad episode. Get the hell out of here, Raph, this is my section. Anyway, I think the best example of great filler in this series is the Cave of Mirrors episode. This was such a cool concept, not really explored in Pokemon up to this point. We got to meet up with the Mirror XY gang whose personalities were literal opposites of the characters we know and love. Also, um, Ash, why did you lie? We're gonna stay on our journey together too, right? Of course we are! <laughs> so yeah, some other great ones are the Pledging Tree, Esper Mansion, the Pokeball Factory, even the episode with Serena cosplaying as Ash is fun. On the other side of this coin, we have the bad filler. And in this series, a lot of the time when a filler isn't good, it's such a drag. I mean, stuff like the Breaks and Stick episode, or the Quilladin episode. Who cares? It's just boring and bland, unnecessary, we didn't ask for it. So, like the pacing, the filler I would say can still be considered really good, but like any series, some is still really bad, and in this series, at least from what I noticed, it's either amazing or terrible, with very little in between. The final point we want to touch on is the ending. Now when it comes to the last episode, it was done beautifully. We get an emotional moment from Bonnie and Dedenne, and great send-offs for both Clement and Serena. Clement getting one final battle with Ash using the same Pokemon in their first ever battle, and Serena with... The problem, however, is that everything leading up to the goodbye makes this one of the worst endings out of any series in my opinion. I like the intention behind the last four episodes, as they're meant to serve as the resolution after the Team Flare arc, but some of the choices they make here are just terrible. For starters, we have Clement rebuilding Clembot. Now obviously this isn't the same Clembot as before as he gets his memory destroyed, but the problem here is that rebuilding a fully functional Clembot right after they just killed him off completely devalues the emotional moment Clement had when he had to make the sacrifice. 
Then there's Serena, having a great episode dedicated to her finalizing her ultimate dream, only to decide that she's gonna become a coordinator in Hoenn. You're kidding me, right? This was so stupid in my opinion, cause we spent all this time with the rushed and underdeveloped concept of showcases, only for Serena to jump into something that was already well established. It makes showcases seem even more relevant. Now yes, I get that her becoming a coordinator is supposed to help her become a better performer, but it just feels like a huge slap in the face to all the development she had when deciding to do this in the first place. Like it basically took Serena a whole series to do what Mei did in 13 episodes. whoop de doo Like if this was the case, then she should've just been doing contests from the beginning. And finally, the absolute worst thing to come from the ending of XY, releasing Greninja in the second to last episode. Like, what the f***? The reasoning behind this is just god awful. The Team Flare arc wrapped up everything perfectly, with Zygarde eliminating all the vines created by Lysander, but then they want to bring them back for some reason and say that Greninja is the only one who can see and stop them? Really? Ash is Greninja and not two f Zygarde whose job is literally to defend the Earth? That makes no sense. What makes this even worse is that there was really no reason to do this. XY was already ending and Ash was obviously gonna leave behind this Kalos Mons at Oak's lab, so he was already not gonna use Greninja anymore. All this did was complicate things if they ever wanna bring him back someday. Thanks XY. Talk about dropping the f ball last minute. And that wraps up all of our topics on the XY anime. Now time for the final verdict. To be honest, it's been a while since I've seen XY, but after rewatching every single episode, I was reminded of just how awesome this series is. One of the biggest aspects of the Pokemon franchise as a whole is the battling, and that's what's front and center in this series. Because of this, it was able to bring back many fans and even reignite their passion for the Pokemon anime. I mean, it's the ones that turned Ash into a complete badass and even took him to the Pokemon League Finals for the first time. What's not to love? Oh. It's not just about the action though, because XY is really so much more than that. What really makes it work is its beautiful storytelling. Whether it's Serena and her relatable development, Clemens and his growth into becoming a more confident gym leader, Bonnie and her relationship with Squishy, Greninja and his quest to fulfill his destiny and become stronger, there's just so much to love and get invested in. Now that's not to say it's perfect, as there's no such thing as a perfect series. Cause I'll admit, when the focus isn't on plot, the series can get pretty boring, but aside from that, like Diamond and Pearl, XY had direction and knew the story they wanted to tell from the beginning. They said how can we take the typical Pokemon adventure and make it mean something, make it grander, make it epic. I'll tell you how, by building up to the Fantastic Team Flare arc where they gave it everything they had. So in conclusion, do I think XY is overrated? Not at all honestly. Now sure, some of the diehard fans might go a little overboard defending this series, but I don't blame them. There was just so much done right here. Ash was the coolest he's ever been, the characters were lovable, his Pokemon were awesome, the battles were amazing, and the story was… straight up epic. This is what many of us wanted out of a Pokemon series, and we got it with XY. This is how you turn the games into a freaking anime. Thanks for watching everyone, and special thanks to Zoro, Tyrone, and Raph for joining me. Also, thanks again to Spire and Silverstorm for some of the awesome covers. Last but not least, make sure to live your life to the fullest, and I'll see you next week for my review of the Sun and Moon anime. Zack is cringe.